Hey, Brand Builder, Rory Vaden here. Thank you so much for tuning in to listen to this interview. We are so excited to bring you this information and wanted to let you know that, hey, there's no sales pitch coming uh, from anything that we do. This is all our value add to you and the community. However, if you are somebody who is looking for specific strategies on how to build and monetize your personal brand, we would love to talk to you. And we offer a free call to uh, everyone that's interested in getting to know us and is willing to give us a chance to get to know them and share a little bit about what we do. So if you're interested in taking us up on a free strategy call, you can do that at brandbuildersgroup.com slash summit call. brandbuildersgroup.com slash summit call. Hope to talk to you soon. On with the show. So you're listening and probably your dream at some point in your life as a personal brand is to like be on Good Morning America or be on The View or, uh, you know, it, it, this America This Morning. And uh, you're about to meet the host, one of the hosts, uh, an Emmy Award winning journalist, a new friend of mine, Paula Ferris. Um, she was a co-anchor of Good Morning America. Um, weekend and she was also the co-host of The View for like three years. Um, she has been on World News Now and anyways she's awesome and I met her mm -hmm. at the Global Leadership Summit. She was another one of the speakers. Totally uh, connected with her. She has a new book that is called Called Out which we'll talk a little bit about but I thought you had to hear her story about um, how she got to where she is some of the things that we can steal from her and learn in terms of some of her skills and then also um, hear a little bit about her new book and why she wrote that so anyways paula welcome to the show i'm the interviewer and you're the guest how's that I, it feels kind of awkward but you buried the lead Rory, <laughs> which is one thing that you don't want to do in broadcast uh -oh. journalism don't bury the lead you forgot to mention that i am the global leadership summit um, cornhole champ in mm. some capacities because it, it, Rory just mentioned that we met at the Global Leadership Summit in Chicago. What he failed mm. to mention was that um, I schooled him in cornhole. And if you're familiar with, unfamiliar with cornhole, mm -hmm. some people call it what? What's bags. The other bags, which I don't understand that. But it makes no sense. I have to say you were really gracious in defeat though. So um, well, I have keep a talking as long as you want because we're going to edit this entire section <laughs> out. So just let me know when you're done. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, yeah. Well, you weren't the only person who embarrassed me. Uh, there's a great video of Sadie Robertson, uh, Sadie yeah. uh, Huff, destroying me as well. So, you know, I wouldn't. Yes, it's true. It is true. Um, but we, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take too much pride that. in it. You weren't, I'm not like a formidable foe. Oh, well, I listen, I think there's plenty of room for growth there. <laughs> <laughs> there definitely, definitely <laughs> is. Well, so I, I just thought, you know, it was really cool because you got at GLS, you, you were, you got, I got to see you kind of in both roles. Like you were kind of doing the hosting kind of MC thing. Um, and then you were also speaking about the, about the new book, but I, you know, short of just thinking you're awesome and, you know, me and AJ kind of connecting with you and your daughter and just like that whole thing, I, I really thought, wow, this is a rare opportunity to learn about hosting because I, I think like a lot of our clients and even myself, my dream was to be a speaker. Like I wanted mm -hmm. to be a speaker and there's a lot of people who talk about that. And then there's like writing and then there's social media, but more and more like to me, the podcast medium is the most rabid fan base that we had at our former company. And it's still the most rabid fan base of email and social and book readers and people who see me even speak live. Our podcast listeners, are they, are there week in and week out and yet nobody talks about how to be a great host like where do you go to to learn this so i i really just want to hear like how did you even get started and and how sure. do you become how do you become an, an a co-anchor of good morning america like or the view like how do you get to that level so just you know tell us a little bit about that sure well i i didn't grow up thinking that i wanted to be a broadcaster it just kind of 
happened, um, my high school drama teacher, his name was Mr. Barsoon. And nice. he, would, he would continually cast me as the narrator of our school productions. And of huh. course, I thought I was like a leading lady and he thought otherwise. So he cast <laughs> me as the narrator. And I actually really loved the role because um, you're telling the story and you're really setting the stage and setting the tone. And he's the one, when I was kind of floundering in my junior year in, in high school, I said, I don't really know what I want to go to college for. He said, you mm -hmm. should consider broadcasting because he knew who I was inherently. I've always been in, innately curious. My nickname growing up, Rory, was Paula 20 Questions. Mm. So I've always been innately curious. I love to ask questions. I like to champion and challenge people. He knew that about me. And then coupled with the fact that I can tell a good story with my intonations and connecting with people, the way that I narrated these school productions. So he, that was honestly the first time I thought about going into broadcasting. And so I did, I went to college for it, but um, I, instead of pursuing on air, I pursued off air. So I was producing, editing and writing because I wasn't confident in who I was. I mm. was so scared of failure and you know, fear is one of those, uh, it's one of those tenets that has gripped me throughout my life and paralyzed me from taking the next steps. And so fear for a long time paralyzed me from really pursuing being on camera because I thought I wouldn't have the words to say, even though I had people speaking life into it. I had my college professors, I had my high school drama teacher, I had people around me saying that this is what you're inherently good at and you're comfortable on camera. I didn't believe in myself. And it wasn't until 9-11, when I was working in radio sales, uh, when 9-11 uh, happened, I was so gripped by the coverage and the ability of these broadcasters and hosts to just unite the country through tragedy and, and the way that they were able to tell a story um, and tell it sensitively um, it with dignity through pain. I was, I really felt like that was the first time I accepted that dream for me that that was the first time that I accepted the dream that other people had for me because I, yeah. I said okay I'm going to step into my fear and so I apply I quit my job in radio sales I was making a killer money for a 25 year old I was making like 50 60 thousand dollars a year and we're talking you know 9-11 so 2001 I quit my job and I said I've got to get back into broadcasting I've got to pursue this I've got to stop allowing fear to to grip to grip me and I applied at the local television stations and one station called me back and he said that he wanted to bring me in for an interview to be a production assistant. I was going to make seven. Where is this? Hour. Is this South Carolina? Or in Dayton, Ohio at the time. Oh, nice. So I, was, I, I was in Dayton, Ohio and um, I got hired to be a production assistant making seven bucks an hour. And I had told him in the, in the initial interview, I said, I eventually want to report. I know that Dayton is a large market. I doubt it's going to happen here. And he said, yeah, it's not going to happen here. But unbeknownst to him, in my downtime, I was borrowing the camera equipment, the battery pack, the tripod from the guys in the sports department. On my downtime, I put together a tape. Um, I shot my own stand-ups, which you, if you've ever like, worked in television or worked with a video recorder or any, of any sort, you know it's hard to shoot your own stand-ups. I had nobody helping me, shot my own interviews, all my highlights, I edited it, I handed it to the news director and I said, I just want you to take a look at this. His name was Ian Rubin. I said, Ian, if you could just take a look at this and give me some constructive feedback. I didn't anticipate him to put me on the air at all. I just was literally trying to get some feedback. And he took a look at it and said, you did this by yourself? I said, yeah, I shot it, I edited it. And that's where my production, um, my production and you stole the equipment yeah. right so he was i'm sure he was impressed I, I by that totally, idea yeah that. I, I stole the equipment um yeah you didn't and steal he, it you borrowed, borrowed the resources at the office to do on my work downtime on my downtime but he asked me to make another tape for him a resume reel as we would call it and i was in the midst of making that and he decided to put me on the air and that was that i worked in dayton ohio then i worked in cincinnati ohio for three years and then i moved up um, up the chain to Chicago, which is the number three television market. And then nine years ago, I got the call from the network, which is the pinnacle. It's like getting a coaching job in the NFL. Okay. You start in PV leagues and you move your way up. 
I got a job um, at ABC uh, News and they wanted me to anchor their overnight newscast. And I was like, you have an overnight newscast? What? <laughs> so I, event, I initially went to ABC nine years ago with my family, two little kids. We moved from Chicago to New York and um, I anchored the overnight news. I worked third shift. I wow. did that for a year and then they promoted me and then they promoted me again to Good Morning America Weekend Anchor and then they promoted me again to you know, co-host of The View. So it happened quite quickly, but it was through a lot of hard work and tenacity. Well, what, and just, when like, did you get promoted advocating. to Good Morning? When so tell me so like when did you what year is it that you get on in Dayton and then mm-hmm. what year do you get to ABC overnight and then Good Morning America and then The View? Two thousand one is when I was on the air in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, so you um, went from so seven bucks an hour. Two thousand one to two thousand two was my first like was in Dayton, Ohio. But um, I by the way, when you put me on the air in Dayton, I still didn't get a pay raise. So I was still making seven bucks an hour. Nice. <laughs> but, uh-huh. but that's why I say, take the opportunity, get your foot in the door and kick it down. Don't wait for the opportunity to come to you. And that's what I tell a lot of young kids. They're like, well, I don't want to take this. Take it and prove yourself. And you make it what you want. Because no one, he didn't tell me in that interview, you know, if you want to report, you can borrow the equipment. Like you, you have to take your, you have to take the initiative and you have to dream for yourself and you Amen. have to be tenacious and be persistent. Nobody told me that that could po- was a possibility, but I just, I wanted to go for it. And um, yeah. And I just, I mean, when you go like, Hey, I'm going to be on TV and it's like, woohoo, you're making seven bucks an hour. Like get excited. Mm-hmm. Like what could feel further away? Like mm-hmm. a, the national network morning show, like you couldn't possibly feel further away than seven bucks yeah, an hour. Totally. And so then when do you get to New York? When do you go to I- ABC? Um, I went to New York in the end of 2011, so 10 years later, and that I, uh, Good Morning America happened in August of 2014, and I anchored that show for four years until September of 2018. And yeah. I write about it, I got burnt out. So <laughs> yeah, but that was so that was a, still a 13 year. I mean, that was a 13 year journey no. as as a host, which I think that's that's really powerful to see. Like even that's fast. Um, but it's thir- it's still 13 years 13 from like years, dream yeah. to reality. And I think there's a lot of people that go, Hey, I'm going to start a, I'm going to start an Instagram account today and I hope to be making six figures within two months. And then if it doesn't happen, it's like, Oh, I suck. And it's like, not it doesn't, not really. Mm-hmm. So, so what about, can we talk about the hosting part specifically? Mm-hmm. What do you think is the difference between a good host and a great host. Um, mm-hmm. um, their ability to connect. That I think that's, if, if I'm watching the news or I'm watching a show and I feel like that person is speaking, isn't speaking to me, they're speaking um, or speaking at me, they're speaking to me and speaking with me. If they've made me part of the conversation, if they've invited me into the conversation, mm and invited me um, into the environment, then I feel like that's a connection because so often, you know, we're so polished and my, it's funny because my sister is getting ready to start a YouTube channel and her husband started a YouTube channel and I'm looking at their videos and I'm like, guys, you need to be more conversational. And it sounds so simple, but it's so true because if you're too stiff and too polished, You're speaking at people. You don't want to speak at people. You want to, and the only way you invite them into the conversation is by being conversational, okay? By looking Mm. into the lens and pretend, I always say, pretend like you're talking to one of your closest friends, somebody that you let your guard down around. And I, I asked, I encouraged my sister to do this one exercise. I said, I want you at the very beginning to verbally say, your best friend's name or your husband's name at the end of the, at the end of the sentence. So whatever she might be saying, she'd be like, so today, Drew, I want to tell you about this really cool thing I want to do. So you're, you're injecting that person's name into, into what you're articulating. And then you take a step back and then you're just thinking that person's name and then you're just seeing their face. But what you're doing is you're, you're, you're creating a conversation you're being conversational and you're inviting people and you have a conversational tone, right? So I think 
connecting with people and you connect with them by being conversational. Because mm -hmm. when you're when you're speaking, you really only have one pass. If you're reading something, you know, how many times they say you have to read it X amount of times in order to absorb it. But that's why it's so important. You have one shot when you're speaking and you have to be incredibly engaging and incredibly conversational. Um, and not that you're dumbing it down by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but just connecting on a level where you're being extremely conversational. I think is the most important thing. And I think that's where people have felt like they've connected with me and they feel like I'm authentic. If you can also be authentic within that conversation, um, I think that's a, that's a win-win combination. Were you always conversational as a host or did it, no. did you develop, was it intentional? Was it accidental? Like, how did you, like I, that exercise is awesome, but how, which I, I think that's killer. Like, of going, Hey, pretend you're actually talking in real life. Like there is a one person on the other side of the camera and saying their name I, as powerful. Is that, is that something you had to develop consciously? Totally. I think, I mean, I, I, I think there are certain aspects that you're born with it um, or you're not, but I think it's definitely something that I had. It's a skill I had inherently a little bit of, but I had to grow it. And the way that I had to grow it was just, you know, if you look at some of my early work, it's awful. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I think I was trying too hard. Sometimes we try way too hard to be funny or we're just trying too hard in general. And I, I think just the more relaxed I got, weirdly, it, it's not like I cared less, but it was just the, the more relaxed I got and the more comfortable I was. Some of that came with experience, but some of that just came with being confident in my own skin and being confident about what I was talking about and confident about the, the topic. I think if you're not prepared, you won't be confident and you're, and you will be conversational and you can, or your ability to connect is based upon whether or not you're prepared. So I, that's how much, one of my big fears is not being prepared. <laughs> yeah. But okay. So let's talk about the preparation thing because how much of hosting mm -hmm. is like on a teleprompter versus mm -hmm. like you're talking about being conversational, but some of it is on a teleprompter, isn't it? Which is tough. It's very tough. And that's the thing I was, when I first, when I, my first gig in Dayton, Ohio, um, everything, when I was anchoring, I would, what we say, um, and I don't want to get like too deep in the, in you know, in the weeds with television speak, but you know, you'd be on cam and you'd say, here's my role cue to VO. Um, and I would just give them a, a role cue to VO. So we'd come back on cam and that you're on cam like, Hey, tonight the Dayton dragons are playing the blah, blah, blah. And you'll never guess who showed up and who showed up with that's in the prompter would be my role cue to VO. Okay. So VO means voiceover. So that means when we go to tape and I'm voicing over uh, the highlights. Um, when I first started, I would just say roll cue to VO and I would ad lib everything. I would ad lib the highlights because I started doing sports. That's how I really cut my teeth um, in television. And um, when I was out in the field reporting, you don't have a teleprompter out in the field either. So I'm learning um, probably a little differently than, than a lot of people, a, a lot of my other peers and colleagues. Um, just because that's the way that I was trained in our sports department. So the, the, the challenge is, is when you have a teleprompter, it can, and I feel like in sports, uh, sports anchors are usually really good at their job because they're, they can, they're quick on their feet, they can improvise, and they can tap dance and they can talk around things. And they're, you know, they're, that's just, the, that's the, the sort of situation that they're used to. They're used to sure. ad living highlights and ad living stories, whereas in news, it's much more produced. And so when I came from sports to news, because when I, when I was in Chicago, Dayton, Cincinnati, and Chicago, I did sports. And then I decided to do news, which is one of the reasons I took the job at ABC, because they wanted to give me an opportunity to kind of get my news leg, my news sea legs, because I'd done sports for so long. Um, and everything's very scripted. And it's, it's challenging because it's, it's hard to have that conversational tone when when everything has been scripted for you. Right. So, but there have been moments where the teleprompter has died and I'm like, yes, finally, you know, we can, 
that this is I mean this is this is how I this is how I was trained this is probably where I'm most comfortable but um it is a mix if you're in the field and you see a reporter out in the field like in front of the white house or in front of a stadium there's no there's typically no teleprompter for any of that that's just all off the cuff um uh, but if you're in studio most of the time there is a teleprompter and I hate teleprompters because I just think they become a crutch and you just and they take that conversational tone, which I think is so imperative to the connectivity. They they remove that from the situation. Now, what about like on the on the view? Oh, there's no. That's not a teleprompter. Either. No, that's like no. There's no teleprompter there. There might be a teleprompter for uh, sponsored segments, but no, that's all right. off the cuff. And it's it's it can be. A little it's very nerve-wracking because you're not really sure what everybody's gonna say. Whoopi Goldberg, I love Whoopi, and she would always say, you know, we would have the hot topics meeting in the morning. Uh, we would show up at I think our meetings were at 8 30. Yeah, 8 30, and then the show was 11 o'clock Eastern. And so we would have the hot topics meeting, we get this huge packet, and um most of the times we would get it the night before, but then it was revised by morning, and you just we pick out the stories that we want to talk about that day. And um, based upon our uh, fire and our passion for the stories, the producers would then pick the stories that we were going to do for the show, mm -hmm. right? And what we were going to cover. We didn't, and if we got a little too heated in the Hot Topics meeting at 8.30, what we would say, no, no, save it for the table. So she didn't want us to, to totally go there because she didn't want, she wanted so much of, and kudos to her, she wanted so much of it to wait for the table, for the Hot Topics table so that, um, we didn't know where, we didn't know what the other person was going to say, because it keeps you on edge and it keeps the conversation like really fiery. Um, so, uh, that was a situation where we would be, would say, yeah, let's not, don't give too much of it away. Save it for the table. Yeah. Her, so you went from mantra. like totally impromptu to totally scripted to all the way back to like completely impromptu. Yeah. And, and like that's the holding journey. on, yes, like sitting on the edge of my seat, not sure what the hell was going to happen next. <laughs> it was, uh -huh. Yeah. It was a little, it's very, it can be scary. And for a journalist, you know, and I, I had the added pressure. I was still, when I was doing the view, I was still anchoring Good Morning America weekend. So I was still a journalist and I, I didn't want to say anything that was going to foil my news career because I, my number one objective was to stay neutral and to stay objective and really kind of like tiptoe around a lot of the, the political talk because when I was first hired, this is pre-Trump. This isn't, you know, he, he was just throwing his name into the hat in the primaries and, you know, and then he became a nominee and then, and then he became president and then it became a really political show. And, um, but it was tough for me because I was given explicit directions by my bosses on the news side, ABC News, that I couldn't give political opinions because mm. of, because I was a journalist and still anchoring one of their flagship shows. So um, when it became a new, a strictly, when it became very political, the show, it was really uncomfortable for me. Um, and I felt like I couldn't go there and I felt like I couldn't give the audience what they really, really wanted. And that was probably one of the first times that I felt like um, I felt like a failure in many regards because I wasn't able to connect um, with the audience because the audience, it's called the view for a reason. They want you to give your opinions and give your views. And I would give my opinion and views on most everything except for abortion and politics. And that's really the, sh the show started turning towards Sure. When it became political, it was really uncomfortable. So do you think this translates pretty directly for a podcast host? I mean, like, or a YouTube, like a YouTube channel. Like if you're not, do you think this con this topic, these kind of lessons, do you think they apply to just somebody with a mic, you know, like me, right? I mean, sure. like, is mm -hmm. it going, is it the same, is it the same idea, whether it's, you know, national <laughs> television or it's a local podcast, the idea is just to connect is to connect honestly with the audience and that Absolutely. is the most important thing. Absolutely. I think that is a, that's the baseline. That's the foundation of everything. And you can do that through a myriad of ways. Like the way that you were able to connect with me early on, like kind of telling a joke and. By like um, letting you, know, you win what, at cornhole. Yeah. That, yeah, let, that is exactly. part of my strategy. So we were already connected. Uh huh. But, but you put me at ease as a host. I will tell you, you put me at ease because 
you have done your research on me. And I, I detected that just from what you, the way that you introduced me. And for me, if I'm doing a big interview with someone and I haven't read their book and that's why I'm sitting down with them, or if I haven't done my homework, um, they're going to know that. Okay. So what you do is I, I always say it's so important to do your research um, on whomever you're interviewing, whoever you're sitting down with, whether you're hosting a podcast or you're conducting an interview, do your homework. It's so important to put the other person at ease. And you don't have to, like, you can just, you don't have to say, oh, I read your book and it's amazing. You can just say, yeah, I read this. I, you know, I remember this one line in your book and you said this and that to them triggers, oh my gosh, they took the time to read the book or they took the time to do some research on me. And yeah, at least like open the book. book. Yeah, to open the book. And you'll see <laughs> yeah. that, but you'll see that other person's guard kind of come down. And then they're like, yeah. I, and I can open up to you now because you have put me at ease and you've made me feel comfortable. And you've showed me that you care enough about this interview that you've done a little bit of homework. But if you haven't done any homework and you haven't done any research, then the way that I interpret that as the person that's being interviewed is that you don't care. And if you don't care, then why should I care? Why should I open up? Interesting. All right. So last little part here. Mm -hmm. Why'd you leave? 13 years, you're like uh, at the top of your game. You're at two, I mean, literally two of the biggest shows more than in the 13 world. Years. More than, was, like, well, seven. yeah, it was 13 to get there. And then you were like, you were at the peak. Yeah. You were like doing the thing here for five, six years. And then all of a sudden you made a decision to leave. Yeah. To, I, I made a session, a decision to step away to pump the brakes at the height of my career, which I thought was totally insane. And, but I was burnt out. And mm. I think what I was doing for so long is I was chasing these accolades and achievements and it never seemed to satiate. And I became addicted to this thing. And so often we misplace our significance in something that shifts like a job or your bank account. And for me, I had misplaced my significance in something that shifted. And I was at a professional high, but it was at what cost? What good is it for a man to gain the world, but to lose his soul? And mm -hmm. I it just, it came at, for me, it came at too high of a cost. I, my relationships with my, with my kids and husband were really not doing well. And I wasn't going to church and my health started suffering. And I thought, okay, I don't think I was called to do this if this is what it was going to cost. And I don't think everybody is, is, called to to walk away or to blow it up, you know, for all intents and purposes. But for me, um, I really felt like, and I'm a person of deep faith. Uh, um, I really felt God called me out of that space where I was addicted to what I did. Um, I was really scared um, to, to walk away because I was scared. I was like, I built this career. I don't want to just disappear into the ether. Um, um, I was scared of being irrelevant. I was scared of what people would think of me. I didn't know what was on the other side. I just knew I needed to get my life back because I was working crazy hours and I wasn't seeing my husband and kids. And the things that I said were, um, of value to me, Rory, you wouldn't have known those based upon the choices that I was making, uh, professionally and personally. So I, I didn't really truly walk away until I went through a really tough season, um, like a season that a lot of us are going through right now uh, with the pandemic, but my personal hell happened in seven months and I had a miscarriage with an emergency surgery. Then I got hit in the head before a live shot for good morning America. Some kid threw an object at my head, 60 miles an hour, had a concussion. Um, the day I was cleared to go back to work, I was out of work because of that incident for three weeks. And the day I was cleared to go back to work, I get in a head on car crash and then I got influenza and then I got pneumonia and that was seven months. So I knew at that point, Whoa. it wasn't just a string of bad luck. That was God saying, you need to slow down. You need to find out who you are uh, because you have, you have wrapped up your entire identity in this. But it wasn't until I stepped, and it was after that season of hell, I decided I needed to slow down and walk into this space where, you know, I told my bosses, they were gracious enough to kind of like, you know, they said, well, we want, we, we want you to stay here. We'll let you work Monday through Friday. And you can walk away from the view and from good morning America weekend. And, you know, you can be a correspondent. And I asked them to launch a faith podcast, but I was still kind of figuring it out. I knew I just needed to get my life back, but they were gracious enough to let me do that. And, um, but it was scary because it was, I write much of the book in that space where I walk away from these two things that 
I didn't realize had defined me and they had, and I had no clue who I was outside of them. I didn't, I didn't know myself anymore because I was Paula Ferris, the anchor of Good Morning America and co-host of The View. And then all of a sudden I wasn't. And I, I didn't know how to process that. And so I write a lot of the book about finding out like, who are we outside of what we do, outside of the things that we place our significance in. And there's nothing wrong with loving what you do, but how do you find that balance between loving what you do and not being defined by what you do? And so that's what mm. much of the book was for me, finding out the parts of me that won't change in a pandemic and the parts of me and so who I am out in that won't change in a personal crisis. Just digging into that because our society tells us to lean in and to, to find our calling and it's always career related and we do and we press in and guess what? Career will, will change at some point in our lives. And if we, you know, status on Instagram will change, our bank accounts will change. And if we place our significance in those things that are going to shift and we're not going to know who we are outside of them. So it's so important to, to find your true purpose outside of doing, to find, um, to discover that personal mission statement, but to find the parts of you that won't, like what parts of you won't change um, in a crisis. For me, I would have said, I'm Paula Ferris, I'm the anchor of Good Morning America and The View. And, and when that changed, I had to figure out what my mission statement was. And now it's my purpose statement. I just say, I'm Paula Ferris, I love Jesus. I, I'm a wife, I'm a mom. I'm curious, I ask lots of questions and I like to champion and challenge people. And so those, th those, you know, championing people and being curious and question asking a lot of questions, those made me an effective communicator and made me an effective broadcaster, but um, those things aren't going to change the way that I, that I go about manifesting them will, whether through it's a broad, broadcast capacity or through another capacity. So um, that was really important for me to, you know, to figure out. And that's why I wrote the book. Wow. Um, well, the book is called Called Out, um, and of course, you can get it anywhere great books are sold. Um, don't go looking for it wherever crappy books are sold. You won't find it there. Um, <laughs> where do you want people to go, Paula, to connect uh, with you or if they want to link mm -hmm. up? I mean, obviously, Instagram yeah. and all that kind of stuff, but where would you point yeah. people? You know, I, I developed this gift of um, telepathy during the pandemic. So people can just reach out to me through their minds if nice. they want. I, I know. I don't know what happened, but um, you know, Instagram's probably the best place um, to reach me. And it's Paula Ferris. My last name is spelled just like the city of Paris with one R. One R. With an, with an F like Frank, Paula Ferris. So and pick up the book, support it. I really appreciate it. Let me know how, how, um, how you connect with it. And it's just been great to see, to hear from people and say, oh my gosh, I feel like you were writing my story, uh, men and women indiscriminately. So um, yeah, reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. I love this. I mean, uh, if, if you've ever had a struggle with identity, which is all of us, yeah. Um, particularly those of us with personal brands separating that, you know, what we want to be seen as from who, uh, you know, online or wherever, but and yeah. who we really are. This is a really, really key discussion um, from s someone who was at the top of her game and left that all behind. So we'll link up to called out. We'll uh, obviously AJ and I'll do the debrief of this in the next episode. You can check it out. But um, follow Paula and uh, connect with her. It'll be interesting to see how she reinvents herself uh, in this next phase. And thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. And I can't wait for that, um, that redemptive game of cornhole. Okay? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. We edited out that section. <laughs> I beat him at cornhole. Don't let him edit. Ah, no, no. no. Uh, all right. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, <Lori. laughs>